An old friend of Electric Playground is back on the show, and I'm very happy that he is. This is Lorne Lanning, who co-founded Oddworld Inhabitants, given us lots of adventures in the Oddworld universe, but a new one is coming. It's called Soulstorm, and you're bringing Abe back. It's great to see you, Lorne. It's great to see you, Victor. Thanks for having us on. I'm glad you showed up. It's a treat for me because I have very fond memories of meeting you for the first time, and I think you worked with GT Interactive back Long in the day. A long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. On a PlayStation 1 game, That's I think. Right. Yes. That's right. Abe's Odyssey PSX. PSX, yeah, and it was a pretty phenomenal ahead of its time experience. You created this character with kind of a cinematic quality because you yeah. came from the CG world rhythm and hues, I That's think. Right. Is where That's right. Yeah, from. we were uh, visual effects people out of you know, computer graphics in Hollywood, and I wanted to tell more stories, and Abe became the vehicle to do that, Oddworld the way to do that. And here we are now, you know, 20, going on 26 years later. Incredible. With uh, you know our ups and downs in the industry, but we had the opportunity to start taking Abe to a new evolutionary level. It looks amazing. When we released the first title, I said yeah. this is the first of a five-part series called the Quintology. Right, right. And then I got right off track of that right away, just because of business needs, partners sure. demands, you sure. know, things like that. Yeah. So I felt like we got off target, and the IP was shaping it a little bit in the direction away from that original idea. And when we started self-publishing, self-financing, and with digital distribution, we were able to do that. And because of that, we said, well, let's get back to the roots. And that's really what this is. Let's get back to that root vision of a, s a small, seemingly helpless slave fighting his way up from the very bottom, and eventually we will change the world. We'll, yeah. we'll rise to uprisings, to eventually to revolutions, to sinking economic markets. Global economies will be affected. Awesome. Shit's going to really hit the fan. That's awesome. And so, you know, if he can do it, so can you. And I don't mean to encourage, yeah. like, come well, on. You did, you did the James Cameron, take a break, and then come back with a, <laughs> a flurry of sequels. So, like, you know, do we have a new trilogy that we can expect now? Well, hopefully we're on part two of the Quintology right now. So yeah. there's three more to go. You That's know, incredible. hopefully I live long enough and the fans support us long <laughs> enough that we can actually deliver on them. Are we going to see connections to the, the Abe's they adventures the and, and, and Munch and maybe Stranger is. They all live yeah. on the same planet. Okay. So there's there's the opportunity to cross more paths. I think in the beginning I was thinking that each quintology would have Abe as the main character, but would focus on a new character, and that's kind of what happened in Munch's Odyssey. Yeah. And I didn't understand a lot of things about perception, markets, branding. Yeah. Uh, that that really wasn't a good idea because people are like, no, it's not an Abe game. Okay, yeah. I'm not going there. Right. Whatever. It's confusing. So we're staying with Abe on the main theme, mm -hmm. and Abe's journey was always deep and rich enough. Of where it was going that we said let's just focus on Abe as the main character through this Quintology keep that part simple and yeah. just as the technology gets into next gen and next gen then, then we were able to exit the third world enter the third world the second world of overpopulated shanty towns and then eventually wind up you know dead smack in metropolises when we have more horsepower we can have tens of thousands of characters on screen at one time and really raise holy hell with riots and uprisings and social unrest <laughs> I mean, thinking <laughs> that's the that's the mechanics I want to get into well we I mean, we're going to have horsepower that does that. But let's talk a little bit about the mechanics that we have mm -hmm. in Soulstorm that you weren't able to do before that is brand new to well, the experience. One just started with fire. So yeah. the story and the mystery of Soulstorm is related around the brew. It's not a uh, alcohol, it's an energy drink. And it's used to enslave people. And so this is the mystery, and it has a really dark side. And so that gets uncovered through the story. I don't want to blow that now. But one of the key elements of the brew was it's flammable but it comes as a liquid beverage, right? So we had this idea years ago how I wanted to do liquid flammability, yeah. and which is, you know, I don't see done. So this idea I was thinking in, you know, 98, thank God I didn't have the opportunity to implement it because it never really would have, the horsepower wasn't there, but now we can, like yeah. we can we can do this. And as we start burning, we go, oh, we need more things to burn down if we're gonna have burning, you know? Yeah. So that escalated into changing playing fields, alterable playing fields, fields through the action where floors getting shot out on you, things are burning and collapsing on you, you know? We really wanted to simulate the feeling of playing in a disaster area, yeah, yeah. right? Like, like industrial level disaster areas. Awesome. And at times using that as your weapons. You know, using collapses as your and, abilities. And Abe's followers also pack weapons this Abe's time. Abe's followers this time. So traditionally, Abe's followers were beasts of burden. You got points for saving them, but they didn't give you any real benefit, right? They were not very dynamic. They couldn't follow you. They couldn't hoist after you. I mean, they were very limited. So they were real beasts of burden. This time, we said, we need to amp up them so that as I'm ga gathering followers and freeing slaves that become followers, I'm increasing my power. I'm increasing my defensive and offensive power. I'm increasing my carrying power. I'm increasing my mystical abilities. And in all of these, we now have, you know, Ape has full quality, has a full inventory system. 
There's crafting that's relevant to all of what these mean in the story theme, as we always try to do yep. in our games. And so uh, they become much more dynamic, as I think you're seeing. You know? So a lot of things are happening on that screen at one time. We really wanted to evolve the platformer genre. Totally. And so, something I mentioned is, is taking 2.5D to 2.9D, yeah. where you're actually able to have a predictable playing field that is in the 2.5D nature. Use that in ways like the bouncing and the reflecting. So each level is almost a pool table of predictability of angles and nice. things that you can reflect off of. But then you can go deep into that world and what's happening, what you see in that world, you will eventually get to. You know, so we it took us a lot of time to figure that out. Uh, it would have been easier just to have open world than, than the way we're doing it now. But that stayed true to what our most hardcore fan base wanted and new fans were reacting to it as well. So we stayed on that path. So what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is that this is no 25 years later kind of just small cash in. This yeah. is a massive Abe's adventure. Yes. And it's got all the latest tech that you guys are, can do, but implementing on a lot of things that you've learned, yeah. staying true to the story, yeah. kind of uh, pillars that you've always had. Yeah. And it's a big game. But is it's, it, it's is a, it a, it's a big game. Is it a tougher game to make than the original Abe's? Yes, because the scenarios in the original Abe were very digital, mm -hmm. right? There'd be one way to solve a puzzle, right? There'd be, and the puzzles would be very one-on-one, -on -one, you know, Abe against meat grinders, or Abe against this, or Abe with two guys that he could follow. Only one guy could follow him at a time. Right. Now you can have up to, as you see, like 30 guys following you at a time. Yeah. The hostility measures that they encounter <laughs> are much, <laughs> much greater. The sense of trauma that you feel when they get whacked is much greater. So all, all of that increases what we've always been after, which is how do we get more feelings of empathetic connection to our characters? How do they feel more expressive? And how do you feel more responsible for them when you're going through you know, what you, what you need to do. Yeah. And if we can do that, then you're more invested and you want to do the right thing. Or you could do the exact opposite, right? You can play these levels, you can rescue and kill no one, rescue all, or you could kill everyone, right? Yeah. And that leads to different karmic outcomes. So karma is something that's sort of calculating in the background of how you do things. And if you do things really mean, you know, they really come back to bite you. When I talked to you originally about Abe's and some of your ideas around Oddworld, there was this idea of uh, world in peril. And you had some anarchistic thoughts in your head about capitalism and, and the way that we're literally eating our our futures, yeah, you know? And yeah. is that still pervasive through the storyline yeah, of this? Yeah. Yes. You know, I've been referred to as anti-capitalism, and yeah. uh, I don't think that's accurate as much as capitalism is just a wonderful backdrop for a fucked up world. And in that, I've taken capitalism to the extreme, right. you know, in a mythological way, so yes. I've embodied that like an archetype. This is the archetype of unconscious well, reaping I, of the world. Yeah, well, know? again, I think you were ahead of your time because yeah. that's where, like, the world caught up to that kind of thinking. <laughs> well, this the is world, a, The world caught up to noticing yeah. what was already going on, right? Yeah. Like George Orwell in 1948 wrote 1984. Yes. And the reason he had changed the title, it was, it was w what he wrote about the future was happening then. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so it's funny, in hindsight, you know, people used to say, oh, you're anti-capitalism. I was like, not really, but it's a great backdrop. Yeah. And I'm anti-everything else, too, so don't make any mistakes. Yeah. You know? and, and there's a lot broken in the world. <laughs> and I think you're, you're always sort of telling us that in your stories. And I think it's... it's uh, it's important to me as, you know, sort of black comedy, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. let's make fun of us. Let's sure. make fun of all of us. Uh, Abe is like a direct parable to Charlie uh, Chaplin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even yeah. in the basic moves of how we do the slapstick comedy, yeah. those were original original inspirations with silent movies, over-exaggerated animated characters, you know. But for political commentary at all, we have to laugh at ourselves, right? Yeah. So we really try to make it sarcastic in a really dark way. Right. As the series unfolds, then we really hope to get into that deeper and deeper and deeper. You know, South Park inspired me right no one's safe nice. no one's safe that you're not going to attack and make fun of and have you noticed uh, like the youtube generation and future sort of uh, people that you didn't even consider when you made the first game start to pick up on that and start to kind of dig into the yeah. mythology that you yeah. created well what i'm amazed to find now is that a lot of people were playing this game when they were like five and six you right. know? and i'm like well, what yeah. were your parents thinking they were like well i was watching my dad play from under the bed but i was terrified it's cute yeah. and terrifying it's cute that, and that's and what terrifying. you built right? yeah it's like <laughs> muppets meets the x-files i love know? in uh in Stranger's Wrath, where you actually have living ammunition. Live ammo. That was amazing. Live ammo. <laughs> well, it was how do you make a shooter that's not a traditional shooter, yes. and how do we make a guy who's your shooting hero character who doesn't like guns, yeah. you know? So these are the twists we like to put on it, because we always like starting with antagonists that are not at the top of the food chain, that are not the guy you'd want to be. They're probably the last guy you'd want to be, but yeah. if he can make it, you probably can in the world too, and that's yeah. my basic sort of fable sort of intent of awesome. inspiring people. And I'm amazed that 
how many people it's actually done that to? You know, how many people, uh, I see some guys sometimes, they're like, that's terrifying looking guy, he's a big guy, you know, like in, in Europe, something goes, and he'll open his shirt and it's like big Abe tattoos on his chest. And he goes, my brother and I, in another, you know, hooligan looking yeah. mass of meat, right? Yeah. Like, my brother and I, you have no idea, dude. We went through such shit with our stepfather, but Abe got us through. And that's, that's why amazing. we're both, you know, huge fans. I have everything you ever made. Like, yeah. you're really surprised at the range of people. Uh, I think it's a lot of, a lot of the fans are people that feel isolated. And quite frankly, in the world, they feel alone. You totally. know, and that's one of the biggest problems in the world. And also, like, just bringing it back to the capitalistic nature of video games too. There's such a disposable kind of mentality around mm -hmm. this entertainment, mm -hmm. and you built something that is indelible. You well, built something that felt like it had always existed, and that speaks to the permanence of it. Holy shit. When I see Soulstorm, I see a game that kind of makes good on the promise of what you were trying to create visually with the original Apes. It's like mm -hmm. the technology caught up with your imagination. Yeah, I think so. I, I, had I tried this back then, it would have been disastrous. Yeah. You know, I've certainly learned a lot of hard lessons in game design. Yes. I'm, I'm a designer who traditionally over-designed. You know, I think so. I, I see that a little bit in this, <laughs> in this But game. I think that's what, that, that's what keeps your game so vital for years. People still play Stranger's Wrath and Munch's Odyssey and you know there's this realization that there's all the nooks and crannies all of the world building is so fastidious and so measured and, and thoughtful and that is definitely apparent in Soulstorm already. Well thank you and Soulstorm's got a lot more of that than, than we've ever had before so uh, you know we still got a, a ways to go we're pre-alpha what you saw is pre-alpha yes but we spent a lot of time on it looks system. releasable to me it does well, but great, you're, you're great. coming out <laughs> next year with this game yes, right? That's right yeah that's right. how do you make a, a call like that do you make it yourself or do you have a group that's well, we a, have you know I'd like to make the call myself and then I get beat up and uh, people tell <laughs> me uh, in-house and out you know <laughs> and then you're wrong on your prediction and you get beat up by everybody yes. but you just try to make your best guess I mean you can't spend forever on a game eventually you run out of money so yeah. you got to try and be smart and try and focus on the things that really matter that are going to make a difference and hopefully you're nurturing your your fan base along the way so by the time you get to market people actually know about it awesome. which is huge but this time has been really surprising because just in the videos, the short trailers that we've been putting out, we're exceeding any views we ever had in the past, so we're now seeing, you know, millions of views on videos and things like that, and it's staggering for us. We exist in a world where video games have reached people in a lot of different ways, but there is a bit of an exhaustion with a lot of the business models and a lot of the ways that people are building games, so I think when you see a game like Soulstorm, which is bringing back a character that is beloved, there's this idea that we can you know, return to simpler days a little bit. Well, we can. I think you, part of that is, is we're not trying to chase the market. Like, we're not chasing free-to-play MOBA. You know, we're not yeah. chasing yes. uh, these things. We believe that a large part of the audience still wants a dedicated single-player story game that they can get deeper into, has, you know, enough depth that there's a ton of replay value. Our initial target on this was to get through it in 10, between 10 to 13 hours for a speedrunner. Right. And then, but with all the things that we've added, as you've seen, there's a lot of capabilities that Abe didn't have in the past. It really, it, it really encourages more exploration of secret areas, more discovery of things that you can use in the world in an anarchistic way, you know, uh, with the homeless, uh, the, the scavengers economy, you know. Nice. These things, uh, they really, we were testing early levels at 15 minutes, and then when we added the rest of the features in, the achievements in these things, people were starting to spend an hour and 20 minutes in the same level. Amazing. And really, really then starting to search out and, and discover secret areas and etc. Everyone in there is playing. There's four secret areas in that level they're playing. No one's even seen them yet, you know. So I Which puts a huge smile on your face. Yeah, so. I think so. I like, yeah. I like knowing that. So I think they'll be in replay value 100 plus hours easily. We also wanted to have stats and achievements and leaderboards all t stack up per level, right. which uh, on some ways can, for some users, be distracting to the overall story flow. So you can sort of turn off that and, and tally it up in the end and see how you scored on every level. Then you can go back and replay it and try and get all your achievements, all your medals, all your, you know, full, fully milking the possibility. Is that in partnership with maybe some new collaborators that you've brought on, on board at Oddworld Inhabitants? It feels like in, this in is... The designers? And yeah, stuff? it feels yeah, like it's yeah. you've catered to a much more sort of granular, hardcore gaming crowd maybe than you did with your first kicks at making Oddworld games? You know, maybe. I mean, when I first started making them, I had 
some thoughts like I wanted to remove UI because I wanted it to feel more like a yeah. movie, yes. you know? Yeah. But it, but over the, over time, that's very limiting, you know? So it's an interesting idea, but it doesn't necessarily add that much more longevity and play and capability to the game right. or inform players in the way that they need to be informed. And those were a lot of hard lessons for me, uh, especially today. You get to watch people on YouTube playing your games and seeing where they get stuck. And if only <laughs> I'd known that 20 years ago, you know? <laughs> so it was really important to us to, to evolve it in a way that was exciting but still tra stayed true to the original nature of that character and yeah. I think that was a big challenging part so we wanted fresh blood to look at it something I tell people on the team you know whether they're engineers or designers I go look th these opinions that you're giving us like you might be an engineer but you have this passionate opinion about gameplay we want to hear it we always want to hear it even if we don't use it even if it feel you feel like we're ignoring you don't stop telling us right. because for us it's not like I need to build the game that I need to feel good about I need to build the game that the audience needs to feel good about right. and I need to be happy with and that good ideas come from everywhere and good ideas come from everywhere so right. there's a lot of, of nurturing that. We've got uh, four continents working on it because we're a distributed development team. So we've got people in Canada, we've got people in the UK, we've got people in Australia, we've got people distributed around the United States in a very small office in Emeryville. So it's very interesting because it works a bit more like a film model cool. in terms of scaling for the production, scaling down in between productions. It's given us flexibility, but it's brought new ideas and new talents to it, different perspectives. Why have you stayed with video games? It's a it's such an up and down business. Yeah. It's a tumultuous one. Yeah. It's a challenging one for yeah. people at every scale. Yeah. And you've had lots of different careers and lots yeah. of different sort of roads yeah. in your career, but you've stayed with video games. Why? I think it, it it's one of the hardest things I've ever did, hands yeah, down. Like yeah. people say, oh, I love making games. <laughs> making games is terrible, but it's brutal, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's hard on your health, it's demanding, it's frustrating the whole time. You know, most of the time you're building things, things don't work. Yeah. But I think the, the fan base is really part of what keeps you going. When I look at all the Abe tattoos out there, the Odd World tattoos, I mean, it, I'm kind of blown away about how we've we've been able to sustain a couple generations of fans and now we're getting their kids playing and, and this has been working for us. And I've looked at other things, I've tried other things, I've failed at some other things, but games is, uh, you know, I love the possibility of the medium. I feel like we still haven't really hit our full stride. Yes. I feel like, you know, there's still lots to achieve and I hope to be doing that, you know, and we started self-publishing games back a while ago and we, you know, very, very incrementally earned money and spent it and did business the old fashioned way where you actually make a profit and yes. use that instead of raising financing. Yes. And we took our baby steps and we, you know, financed uh, bringing stranger to different platforms, things like that, yep. HD versions that allowed us to earn the money to bank new and tasty. And with the success of new and tasty, which we were really surprised at, you know, both in Metacritic and in the number of, uh, you know, we got over three and a half million downloads on it. I'm telling you, you were ahead of your time. <sighs> well, you know, no, hopefully we're more on time. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's a lot, Abe, Abe really never got his full shake of what we wanted him to be. Yep. And the people kept on asking us to please bring him back. And so we're doing it and we're hoping we're making bigger steps and we hope to keep on making bigger steps, you know, fingers crossed and provided success. So it comes out early next year. Do you have? Yeah. Do you have a uh, a price in mind? Uh, we're we're still evaluating that fully. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's the the challenging we, thing we when you self publish these days, right? It is, and we want to stay away from high end premium. Yeah. You know, uh, I think we're definitely triple A quality. Yeah. But we're not a hundred hour story game like yeah. you know Red Dead or, yeah. or Grand Theft Auto or something yes. like that. Yes. I don't uh, think anybody wants that out of an Abe's <laughs> an Abe's adventure. <laughs> I know I don't. It'll kill me to deliver it. You know. But uh, so in terms of longevity of play, we've got a good, you know, solid 10 to 13 hours for the speedrunner, but easily 100 hours to exploit. And I think the comedic scenarios that people are going to come out of with this is, is you know, I think we're going to see a lot of Twitch people having fun showing different ways to play this game. There's lots of different ways. But back to your question of increased complexity, it is so much more complex. I mean, in the Ape games, we were tracking as variables maybe up to a dozen things that would happen on a save load when you died. Now yeah. we're tracking over a thousand things every time, every wow. time on a save load die, wow. you know? Wow. And so, uh, and that leads, the more capabilities we give the player, the more challenges it creates in tuning and balancing. You know, and we're suffering some of those uh, <laughs> along the way. And it's like, wow, how do, oh, wait a minute, we created this, we overpowered it. And that's all critical to get right. And hence, I'm seeing something that looks finished but it's still kind of a year away. It's still a year away. Yeah, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Lauren, I'm just glad that you're back doing Victor, this stuff. It's great being back. It's great to, uh, to see Abe back in such a big way too. Soulstorm comes out next year. I cannot wait.